I have roughly 157 to 161 unread books on my bookshelf. So this week I'm gonna try to move some of them from my unread shelf to my read shelf. I have some of the unread books around me, but I also have a particular shelf of TBR books that I wanna read more immediately. So shall we choose one at random and just get to reading? Okay, we're gonna have a little shop my library. We're gonna treat my library like a library right now and go shopping for what I want to read. Because obviously I have more books than this that are unread on my shelves, but these are the ones that I'm most interested in right now. All of these books, I'm very interested in reading romance, and then these are all thrillers, but I think I'm gonna save the thrillers for a 24 hour readathon coming up. This book, Wait a second, I read this book. Why is this on here? I think I got this mixed up with another Catherine Center book that I own. Oh yeah. These are the two Catherine Center books that I haven't read. I started Things You Save in a Fire, but she has to take care of a sick parent. I felt like it was getting sad and I was like, I can't handle this right now. I'm not gonna read this. So that's where I'm at with these books. I have the sequel to Divine Rivals that I haven't got to. We have the fourth book in the Red Rising trilogy. That makes no sense. It continues on. It's more than a trilogy. These two big books here, these used to be indie romances, if you can tell by these covers. You actually cannot get these covers anymore because I think they got traditionally published, but these are super viral kind of like TikTok indie romance books that have sat on my TBR for a long time because I read the first 100 pages of this one and then I stopped reading it and it's like 600 pages. So I'm already 100 pages into this one. I honestly should just continue it. And I feel like I'm in the mood for like a Wattpad read, which is what this is if we're being honest. So I think I'm gonna try to get back into this. So I've been reading Binding 13, this massive book with the tiny text. Literally any page I show you would have 1 million cuss words on it. The way that they talk in these books, it's so funny, but it's also so brash. Is that a word? It is a word. Strong, energetic, or irreverent. Bold, audacious, cheeky, impertinent, brazen. Yeah, those are all words to basically describe that they just curse in each other's faces all day. They're always getting into fights. They're threatening to kill each other, but that's just their lingo. That's what this book is like. This book is literally like watching a reality television show of kids in high school who act like they're way older than they are because they're like rugby players, superstars, or this girl who is model pretty. Everyone bullies her and she comes from a really hard abusive home life. So far the book has consisted of Johnny, this superstar rugby player, consistently knocking over our tiny frail little main character Shannon. From the first time that they meet she gets knocked in the head by the ball. I don't understand rugby. Like I don't know what the ball looks like. I don't know if it's like a football. She's walking to class late. She cuts through the field and he kicks the ball wrong or something and it lands on her head and she falls over and Johnny comes over and tries to help her and he just takes a liking to her immediately. You follow Shannon in her house, which like I said, she comes from an abusive household and there's a whole host of things going on in her house that no one knows about. And she got transferred to this boarding school because she keeps getting bullied at other ones. But now that Johnny is aware of her, he's gonna make sure that she stays safe and that she doesn't get bullied. And from that point on, every single interaction they have, somehow it starts with her just running into his chest because she's so small and short and he's so big and tall that she never sees him and she's so frail that she'll just fall over every single time and then he picks her up and then in some shape or form he's always saving her from something. So yeah, there are more layers to it as well. They each have their best friends which I think other books down the line are about but every scene is so drawn out. Like that's why this book is so big. Every conversation that would normally take place in a book it's probably three times longer than that. Like every time I think a conversation is about to be over it keeps going and going and going and it's not that I don't enjoy it. Like I've actually thoroughly enjoyed this book, which is shocking to me because I read the first 100 pages a few months ago and I just was like, I know I could love books like this, but I don't really, I didn't want to at the time. But now my heart is open to enjoying a piece of Wattpad literature. It makes me feel like I'm actually in high school again, but it is a very emotional book. I think it does things so much better than a traditional romance because you just get so many scenes of them in normal everyday life situations. Obviously they're a bit dramatic with her falling all over the place, but that's the fun of it. And you just watch this superstar pop popular boy, take care of a girl who no one has ever taken care of her, no one at her house cares about her, and finally this boy, all he wants to do is make sure that she's safe, and he just has a soft spot for her because he's used to girls using him for his status and where he's gonna go in life, and this girl Shannon has no clue why he has any renown about him, she doesn't know about rugby, she doesn't care, but her brother played the sport so she still kind of understands what his life is like. So yeah, I feel like there's just so many aspects of this romance book that are done so well that traditional romance books miss out on. So many of them just miss out on actually romantic things happening. 
<laughs> and I feel like this one is doing it really well. With that being said though, it's not like a, it's it's like Wattpad pretty much, but I am not knocking that in any way. Like I love books like that. You just have to know what you're getting into because it's definitely like a specific type of writing and it's the type of thing that you could easily hate and make fun of because so many of the things, like I said, are so outlandish. Like Johnny was trying to give her two pills to take for her cramps and she's just trying to take them out of his hand and she like can't do it and they fall everywhere and then he's like oh my gosh just let me pick these up and put them in your mouth like it's so outlandish in those ways but if you don't care about that it's a really fun time i'm 84 percent through and i've only read it on kindle because if i were to read it on this i think my neck would break like it's actually so heavy it hurts my neck and the text is so tiny but i'm on page 513 and it's 601 pages so i really don't have much left so i'm gonna finish it and we'll see what happens I finished it. Those last scenes were cracking me up and then immediately had me crying. I didn't actually cry, but it was really sad at the end and it's a cliffhanger to the next book. But that officially means I get to move this book from this shelf to this shelf. Woo! One more book down. And I honestly just want to dive straight into the next book. And it's already on my TBR. It has been for like seven months. So I might as well read it. They're so long but it's fine. I think I'm gonna do it because I know I will read this to no end and I cannot guarantee that with any other book on here for now. So let's get started. <laughs> The next day, I got about 150 pages into Keeping 13, the sequel to Binding 13, and this one leaves on such a cliffhanger that I dove straight into this one thinking it would be the same experience. But what I said about the first book where you think a conversation is gonna end and then it's six times longer than you expect, that is what's happening in this one, but way, way, way worse in my opinion. Every scene is super dragged out and it's really sad. And I just found myself getting sad, getting really distracted and not wanting to read anymore. So I'm gonna DNF this one for now just because the series as a whole is not really something I'd recommend in general. So I might as well move on. And I'm really craving reading writing that is good in my opinion. Like this writing is not something that, it's not good. I want to read some prose and I'm randomly in the mood for a fantasy book now. I'm gonna take out my bookmark for now. Don't worry, I have it on Kindle so I know where I am. I'm gonna put it back on the unread shelf, unfortunately. I have most of the fantasy ones I could read over here. I think a lot of these are YA too. I have a fantasy romance at the bottom, but ultimately I already know what I wanna pick. Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. I've read one other Brandon Sanderson book over here. It's called Mistborn, it's back here. And his writing is actually very simple for fantasy books. He writes complicated magic systems, but because his writing is not complicated, it feels digestible. But I wanted to pick this one up. I think it's a standalone fantasy book and it's very whimsical feeling. <gasps> That's so cute. The back of the book says, Dear reader, I started writing this in secret as a novel just for my wife. She urged me to share it with the world and alongside three other secret novels with the support of readers worldwide, it grew to the biggest Kickstarter campaign of all time. Oh, what? That's crazy. No wonder, because I started reading this and I was like, this feels so different than Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. It feels like a completely different author. And that makes so much sense. That's so cool. Wow. It's just so whimsical. And I feel like he's writing from a girl's perspective so well, probably because his wife has taught him a thing or two. But yeah, it just starts off really sweet. She's on this little island that they call The Rock and she's trapped on it. And she's fallen in love with the king's son, but she's not not allowed to do that. And suddenly the king announces that he's gonna take his son away to get married to someone. He's like, don't worry, I'm gonna bore them all to death. I will not get married. And let's just say the king figured out his little plan, did not like it, sent him somewhere very far away. And Tress decides that it's only gonna be up to her to save this boy that she loves. So she has to escape the island somehow and go on that journey. So I'm like 50 pages into it, which flew by for me. So I'm pleasantly shocked and surprised that I'm liking it so much. And I'm just so in the mood for like a whimsical fairy tale esque vibe, so. I have my book and I'm gonna try this Barbie Olipop peaches and cream. Let's see if it's good. Oh wow. Yeah, that's kind of gas. White peach gummy flavor. Mmm. And I'm gonna munch on some raspberries. And a storm is about to roll in. This is a perfect reading vibe. 
like I was saying earlier, Brandon Sanderson always has a very unique magic system. And in this one, it's interesting as always. There are things called spores that will fall from one of the 12 moons that just hangs over their planet. And I think they fall down as like sand and they don't harm you unless they're activated by something wet. So like if you sweat, or if you have saliva, or if there's water nearby, it will activate the spores and then it will make vines or trees grow through your mouth and throat and nose and suffocate you to death, pretty much. And if it's like on a ship, spores could fall onto the ship, water activates it, and then the whole thing is taken over by vines and it sinks. So that is the very unique magic system in this book. I don't know how he thinks of them and how they're different in every single book. He is the most creative person. And I cannot stop thinking about the fact that he made this entire book for his wife for one person in mind, which is so cool because when I read Stephen King's memoir on writing, he said that he writes books with one person in mind because if you write something with everyone in mind, it won't be good. So he writes his books with just his wife's reaction in mind, but it's so crazy that he actually never planned on publishing this book. And that is so sweet and special that he wrote this cute little story, but put just as much effort into the magic system and the characters. It's just so crazy. I feel like this is a little secret that I shouldn't be able to read this book, but I can. I can't wait for the storm to roll in. It'll just make it even more cozy. The storm has arrived. Now that's some reading ambiance. Morning. The rats. Look how cute these insides are. There's a talking rat in this book and he's right here. I have about 160 pages left of Tress of the Emerald Sea. The story's really taken a turn. Our main character Tress has gotten herself into a side plot, but it's a good side plot. So it's okay. I just wasn't expecting it. Let's read, shall we? It's the next morning, but I spent the entire day yesterday grinding through Tress of the Emerald Sea. I think I started the day on page 188, and it was like 363 pages total, and I was determined to finish it, and I did. So I read the little author's note at the back, and he said that he wrote this book after watching The Princess Bride with his wife or family. I've never watched that movie, but apparently it's the same vibe where your narrator is separate from your main character, and he's kind of playful with you as the reader talking to you, saying like, oh, I haven't explain this yet in the story or blah 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 and it's supposed to be humorous it's supposed to be lighthearted and fun and playful I think this was published as an adult fantasy but it kind of reads like a YA I think the thing about this book that I didn't enjoy is that I would almost call it a cozy fantasy because I just feel like technically the stakes were really high but they just don't really feel like it and I think I need really high stakes books when it comes to fantasy my favorites are the throne of glass series this is more sci-fi but the red rising trilogy and the thing that they have in common are super high stakes and every time I've tried to pick up a book that's called cozy fantasy or just cozy anything unless it's cozy mystery because those are funny they're just too relaxed for me and I find myself bored every single time so even though this one had very charming characters I really like how it this girl from a small town who discovers that there's more to herself than just washing windows and being in love with a boy she discovers that she's actually really smart and had she never gone on a crazy adventure she would have never discovered that so there's really cute sweet themes but overall I just was struggling to get through it and something about his prose in this one was really difficult for my brain to follow I just felt like every word I was tripping up in my brain reading it and it just didn't flow for me so I'm gonna give it three stars it's really difficult for a Brandon Sanderson book to be bad he's like the top dog of fantasy right now if you were not aware and they made a Kickstarter for this secret project that he made for his wife to actually be published and let me tell you people supported that Kickstarter people love Brandon Sanderson so I will always be curious about his work but this this one was just a miss for me, which I'm really sad about because a lot of people I think love this one. I don't know, it's kind of a mixed bag. So we can officially move this from the TBR to the red shelf. This is the most satisfying thing that I've ever done. I think the book was like right here. So we'll just pretend. Ta-da! My jelly cats are getting pushed off to the side here. We almost filled up the 2024 shelf. This is so exciting. I like to read before bed. So since I finished this a lot longer before bed, I picked out this book, which is three Allie Hazelwood novellas bound together. So there's three little stories in here. And I've read the first one on my Kindle like two years ago. So I thought it would just take me a night to read the second novella. And I actually fell asleep before I finished it. It will probably take me like an hour more to finish it. So I think I'm gonna do that right now because today is a very big day. And I will tell you why in a second. <laughs>
Loki always has a little plot twist. Minor plot twist, but they're there. I have 30 pages left of the novella that I'm reading, and it's so good. Obsessed. But, <laughs> I'm giddy. Today is my Super Bowl. Today is the day that Emily Henry's new book, Funny Story, comes out. It's in that bookstore right now. I have access to it right now if I go in there and walk in and I could read it right now if I wanted to. I can find out what's on the first page in a matter of a minute. That's crazy to me. There is no other author that I get this excited for release day. And this is kind of the antithesis to this video of me walking into a bookstore, buying a new book and then reading it because the whole purpose is that I already have some on my bookshelf at home that I need to read. But here's the thing. If Emily Henry drops a new book, I am buying it regardless. So I could pretend I could keep doing this video and I could pretend that I didn't go and buy this book today, but that would be a lie and you would see it on my shelf the next day. So inevitably this book will be on my shelf. Inevitably, I have to read it as if it was on my TBR. So we're just gonna be honest about it and I'm gonna take you along for the journey because this is one of my favorite days every single year is when her new books come out. It probably seems a little overkill, but I love her books. I think they're like the perfect romantic comedies. There's the perfect amount of romance, of comedy, but also literary fiction. Her main characters go through these mid-20 inner turmoil emotions that I just love reading about because they happen to be Am I in my mid-20s? That's kind of weird. I'm 23. It's kind of weird to say mid-20s. That's really strange. Okay, anyways, let's walk in there right now. It looks like the parking lot is empty. I got here 30 minutes after it opened. Let's go get the book. You got it. I know sometimes life can be tough. I got it. I had no idea that the spine looked like this. It's so cute. And then there's like pops of pink on the inside because the hardcover is pink. This is so cute. This is my least favorite Emily Henry cover, even though this color is like one of my favorite colors ever. The guy is wearing Crocs and I haven't even read it yet, but people keep comparing him to Nick from New Girl. All I know so far is it's a forced proximity, something to do with a very small apartment that for some reason they both end up in. I'm so excited. I'm gonna finish this in the car and then I'm gonna get a new coffee because it's a big day and perhaps I will start this at the coffee shop or at home because I don't have any pens with me. Probably wanna at least underline some things. This literally is my Super Bowl. It's not a funny expression. It is the most comparable thing I could think of. I'm all cozy in bed to start reading funny story, but I did what I said I would and I finished the novella in the car. Ali Hazelwood makes reading so easy, which is exactly why I picked up one of the novellas after reading Tress of the Emerald Sea. So it served its purpose as a nice little palate cleanser because I felt like I was falling into a reading slump reading Tress of the Emerald Sea. So this made me confident that I'm not and was the perfect thing to push me onwards onto greatness. I actually gave that novella four stars. I really liked it. It felt like a smaller version of Love Theoretically, which I loved by her. She gets critiqued for doing the same characters every time and it's so accurate, but I am obsessed with her formula, so I do not care. So four stars for that novella. They are all like, I haven't read the last one yet, but they're all very spicy, so keep that in mind. It was probably like five pages out of an 100 page novella, which is like kind of a lot. So yeah, I will finish the last novella in between reading other books and then we can finally move this from the unread shelf to the red shelf. But for now, I tried to wear an outfit like the character on the book, but my outfit is like a more brown version of it because I don't have a bright yellow shirt like that. And then my pants are more subdued. So I don't think I pulled it off at all, but I can't stand up without disturbing my perfect dog. And you guys wouldn't want me to do that, right? I mean, look at him. He's fast asleep. I made a coffee at home. It's hot, but with a straw because I have Invisalign now and I don't want to get more stain. I have my pen, so let's start this thing. This is my favorite thing to find out what the first line of her book is. And I love the font she uses in her books now. They're so cute. Okay, the first sentence is, some people are natural storytellers. Short and simple. I'll give you the next sentence too for fun. <laughs> they know how to set the scene, find the right angle, when to pause for dramatic effect or breeze past inconvenient details. I wouldn't have become a librarian if I didn't love stories, but I've never been great at telling my own. Okay, find one more. If I had a penny for every time I interrupted my own anecdote to debate whether this actually had happened on a Tuesday or if it had in fact been Thursday, then I'd have at least 40 cents. And that's way too big a chunk of my life wasted for way too small of a payout. Peter, on the other hand, would have zero cents and a rapt audience. Okay, so we haven't even read a page yet. And she's just an expert storyteller in that the first line hooked you. The second line told you a little bit about her. She's a librarian. The third line told you that she's a little bit awkward and stumbles on her storytelling abilities. And the fourth line introduced you to the other character, Peter, who is the opposite of her and is a good storyteller. And that's all in this much book. See how talented she is? I'm gonna read now. It's funny. I 
I think we just met who's gonna be the love interest, but I feel like the way that Emily Henry has been introducing love interests lately have been not in the most attractive of ways, which I think is on purpose when they're supposed to be enemies to lovers, but like in book lovers, when you're introduced to the male main character in the prologue, I thought he was like a 50 year old man from the way that she wrote him. It turned out he was the love interest and he was not 50 years old. And similarly in this book, the way that you meet Miles is he's playing a really loud movie in his room, which is a super messy room and he was just smoking and she can smell it, but it's because he's also heartbroken because they both got broken up with and their partners are now together and now they're living in this apartment together. That's the setup I got from chapter one and Miles has not made a good first impression. So I'm curious to see how we start to like him because I think we're supposed to eventually. Guess who I like? Miles. Yeah, that was pretty easy. It feels like I blinked and I'm 100 pages in. It feels like I'm watching the show New Girl, which I love. I actually have the feeling that I'm liking this book way better than, honestly, Happy Place and Book Lovers. I feel like I'm connecting to the character in this one way more already, and I really like Miles. He's just really nice. He's really sociable. He's tattooed up a little bit. Someone thinks he's a drug dealer. He's giving those vibes, but in a really good way, <laughs> so... I'm now 133 pages in. I'm just so obsessed with this and it brings me back to when I first discovered reading when literally nothing else in the world sounded more appealing than just sitting down and reading my book. If you guys didn't know, Emily Henry is kind of responsible for this entire channel because the first fiction book I ever picked up in my adulthood was The Perfect Couple by Elin Hildebrand. And then the second one I picked up was Beach Read by Emily Henry. And that is the book where I felt the obsession. It lit a fire in me and it hasn't gone out in this is the fourth year now, which is crazy because I used to have obsessions that would last for two weeks and then fizzle out and I still love reading with everything in me. So it's just such a special day to get to read a new book by her and it's totally living up to the hype. So I'm just having a really, really, really good day. And I hope you can all experience this feeling that I'm feeling because it's the best. So let's keep reading. I'm giving therapist office. I'm giving therapist office. <laughs> a lot about the back of my head from shots like this. So it was hair washing day. Nothing scary should be back there. Morning. It's the next day. I continued my reading and I'm on page 244 where I believe there's a mention of beach read because it says that they drove down to a little town called North Bear Shores, which is in this book, for a bookstore event with a romance writer. This book is about two authors. It's gotta be about one of them. That's all she gives though. That's genius. I love that. Yes, I did end up finishing it that night and I'm okay. Thank you for asking. Even though 84 pages is like an hour and a half of reading for me normally, I easily stayed up and finished it because I felt like, oh, it's upside down. <laughs> Towards the end of the book, everything is spiraled out and you can tell there needs to be resolutions to so many things where she has to tie it back up into a bow. It just felt like we were barreling towards the end at great speed, honestly. I think she's gotten really good at having a bunch of through lines in her stories because we weren't just following two characters anymore. We're also following her becoming friends with someone who she works with at the library, the dynamics between her parents. She has a father who likes to come in unannounced and leave unannounced as well. And almost every chapter starts with the date and then it says 76 days until I can leave or it says 16 days until the readathon. So she's planning this big event at her job throughout the entire book. You feel like you know where we're heading, which I think is really genius. And I wrote down in this book that it feels like starting with Happy Place, that one and this one both feel like 
like she's writing the book with a most satisfying words ever dictionary open next to her because her word choice is just so phenomenal nowadays. Ugh. I feel like I could find an example on every page. My heart keens at the thought of my own mother. Keens. This was not supposed to be the example, but I had this underlined. This is in reference to her trying to make friends with people because she feels very closed off because in her childhood, she moved around a lot. But there's this girl named Ashley at her job and she says, if I'm a closed book bound in chains and kept under a padlock, Ashley Rahimi might have just said the one thing that could function as the key. So that part of this book where she is struggling with feeling like she belongs anywhere, either with a group of people or in a city was just painfully relatable. And I think that's why I like this one way more than Happy Place because I personally don't think I really related to the character in Happy Place. I can't even remember what her inner turmoil was because I don't relate to it. If I'm remembering properly, maybe I do and I just don't remember. But this one was any a little bit too in those aspects. In fact, I feel like this book was so good in all the aspects that weren't the romance. And I loved the romance as well, which is why Emily Henry books tend to be five stars for me because literally everything she nails. I saw a TikTok of someone saying that she felt like the two main characters in this book were not meant for each other and the guy was just not her type at all, which I think you could kind of see. I had a similar reaction in the very beginning when I was like, oh, this is Miles is our main character. Like I'm supposed to like that guy. With the messy room and the smell of smoke and Crocs on. Okay, but then you realize it's because they both just got broken up with with people who they thought they were gonna spend the rest of their lives with So of course you didn't get to see him at a nice time perhaps and he definitely doesn't have these larger than life qualities that romance book men Typically have he's not Prince Charming who's gonna take you away and give you the most magical life ever I feel like he's a very subdued character in that he's just a normal guy But he's really likable and everyone in the town is charmed by him and he's just a reliable dude and he has some normal issues Issues that have stemmed from his childhood that he has to work through that they help each other with so yeah it's not like you meet this main character and you're like wow that's my dream man <laughs> I feel like that's really not the vibe in this book but I did root for them and I loved them I loved the descriptions of him he's not my favorite Beach Reed still has my favorite character Gus ever and then I honestly feel like Alex from people we meet on vacation is a close second Charlie Lastra and Nora in this book are entertaining to read about but I didn't really connect with either of them and then I also wasn't like the biggest fan of Win in this book. So I think Miles is one of my upper Emily Henry men and that it's closer to Beach Read than any of her other books. And since this one is so high up in my heart, this one follows suit. I gave it five stars because I like to have fun. I like to love things that I love without picking them apart. Because could I do that? Yes, but I don't really want to. <laughs> I loved it. I loved her word choice. I love her writing. There were no tear jerking moments for me in this one. I cried at the end of Book Lovers. I think I almost cried in Happy Place. So that just ended up being a rank all my Emily Henry books. So yeah, we get to take this book basically from the bookstore and put it on our red books shelf along with this one and this one, almost this one if I read the last novella. We've officially squished the jelly cats to full capacity, which I think makes this video a success. <laughs>